So I take this occasion, it's a special occasion on this Party Mokra Day to uh, Sangha meeting here at Watpanana Chat at the funeral and the cremation of uh, Tulipanyo. And so this is a very impressive, I love very impressive funeral and cremation. I want to give my uh, appreciation to Tanajan Kebli and Sri Panyo, and of course Sajan Tanajan Jayasaro and uh, Tanajan Yanatamo came as soon as they could and helped uh, do this cremation ceremony and it's only been what, three or four days since the death of Tanjuti Panyo but I thought it was uh, I appreciate the fact that it it, it was well done and, and um, something that we could all participate in because we we knew him, and when when a monk dies like that, it does affect us, and as well as the immediate relatives, friends, and so forth. So it's always, you know, important to reflect on death as one of our subjects of contemplation, because it's we're all going to die. And many of us have experienced the death of parents, teachers, loved ones, pets, and so forth. And had to experience the loss uh, of a life of somebody or something that was close to us. <clears throat> and so this is like a reflection on the way it is that this is what this realm is about, birth and death. It's a birth and death realm. And so it's not a realm for happiness and security and safety and pleasure and excitement as if these these kind of conditions could last for any length of time inevitably everything that arises ceases so this is a continuous reflection throughout one's lifetime uh, how the changing conditions uh, both uh, the subtle mental ones, the emotional ones, and all that we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, and feel, uh, is in this inexorable process of change. And that's why in the vipassana practice, it's always emphasis on anicca, impermanence, because there is a kind of ability we have as human beings to fool ourselves in thinking that we can really depend on something or some condition, some situation, some teacher, some method, some religion, whatever, that will give us a sense of security or well-being or safety when actually all conditioned phenomena is, its very nature is change. And even though you've heard this over and over again, it needs to be reflected upon again and again because we do we, we we create ourselves we create the world we live in and each one of you might think we share the same uh, world but we don't in other words we all live in our own world our own sense of our own memories our own emotional tendencies our karma is like this and so it you know we even though we share maybe something in common being Buddhist monks in this tradition and we have a conventional form uh, that unifies us in one respect but individually we all have to live and find out through our own awareness of our own the world the the delusions the the fears the desires that we we inevitably experience uh, in our mind So a sense of conformity in external appearance is uh, what the Buddha encouraged, the shaven head, the robe, 
this uh, sim simplicity to take away or uh, not to emphasize individuality uh, or caste or class or race or nationality or anything is mostly to diminish these identities these uh, perceptions that we have about ourselves and each other but still the tendency the habit tendency is always to to personify every monk here is a, this is I like this monk I don't like that one this is a good monk this isn't a very good one this is junior senior and on and on like that we uh, and then we have uh, different nationalities and different ages and on and on in this way and we do create each other like uh, Jyoti Panyo now is what is he you know is a it's a memory at this moment we saw the the ending uh, the actual burning of his body we can smell it now the the, the burnt body of a Tanjoti Panyo then how we even though I can point this out how each one of us is experiencing this particular situation at this moment is, is only you know what you're feeling or thinking or at this moment to, in regard to the external conditions this is a, a very uh, this is a very ancient tradition uh, traditional form and, and over the years is uh, in, in my monastic life and the power of a tradition has, has really uh, registered with me because at first uh, uh, you know it one just called it the Thai forest tradition or the word tradition really didn't mean much other than it's something that's carried on but the value the importance uh, how to use tradition one learns through the actual usage and through the reflection on it not to attach and form uh, strong views opinions about any tradition but the Buddha did establish this the Dhamma the Vinaya in a way not to be grasped as kind of something to to hold on to but you notice the whole structure of Dhamma teaching uh, in the Sutta is about reflecting on the way things are it's about using our human ability to observe to witness uh, to watch uh, and and not but it's not to it's not a, to criticize the thinking mind your condition thinking mind your intellect is a critical function so it's used to to compare one thing with another with one condition with another with one idea with another but in uh, a Buddhist meditation the point is to develop what they call sati sampachanya or mindfulness and awareness and, and and using wisdom developing allowing the mind to to contact wisdom to let wisdom inform us uh, in a way that we can't from our own personal uh, language thought patterns uh, views opinions cultural identities it's uh, the learning to give up everything it's a total relinquishment that is being encouraged in this life the whole life of a samana is about relinquishing letting go rather than about attaining and achieving and becoming and yet we can interpret Buddhist teachings in terms of attainment achievement becoming uh, success and failure good meditation bad meditation uh, and then we have different ideas about different forms of Buddhism which is the best which is the pure and these are the opinions the views the critical mind that compares one thing with another and it's important to emphasize that uh, the thinking mind is a, is for criticizing for comparing this is bigger smaller important unimportant true and false good and bad and the only way we can get out of that thinking 
dualistic thinking habit is through sati sampatanya or uh, I oftentimes refer to as intuitive awareness, the ability to observe, to watch, and to reflect on the way things are, not not from ideas of how we would like things to be, but from the way it is at this very moment. And of course, this reflection of whatever you're experiencing in this moment, feeling, thinking, uh, is like this. It's the way it is. It's not about what should or shouldn't be, but it's a recognition that at this moment, so much of our feelings, emotional experiences, there's no words that we can actually use to accurately describe exactly how one feels in the moment. But we, with, when we attach to words, to definitions, to new ideas, then we, we bind ourselves to this dualistic function that has its purpose, but is, can never liberate us from ignorance or suffering. And so this, this, uh, the Buddha emphasized the Four Noble Truths. This was his Patomatesana, his first, uh, Desana, his first teaching after, uh, his enlightenment. And so this is why suffering or dukkha is something easy to observe. It's not a kind of highly esoteric, uh, subtle kind of suffering that we need to reflect on. It's just, uh, the ordinary, like the, a stinging ant on, on your arm or whatever, you know, whatever, too hot or, uh, you know, tired or restless or whatever. This ability to observe, it's like this, is the way it is. Conditioned phenomena, you know, whatever you're experiencing through that, through the, through the consciousness and the conditioning, conditioned realm is, can only be the way it is at this moment. Whether you, you know, want it to be or not isn't the issue. It's the way it is. And of course, when we reflect in this way, the way it is, then we're more in touch, more in tune with the changingness, of the Nietzsche of conditioned phenomena. So the, like the Pali teachings of this, this word Aramana, uh, which uh, in Thai, uh, they take the word aramana, arom, it's the, the mental state, the object that we can be aware of in the present moment. And all conditions are impermanent. Aramana then applies to what can be observed in this present moment from this position of pure witnessing, observing, not from taking a particular position or attitude or critical a view about what we're experiencing, but learning to trust this intuitive sense of observing. And so this uh, one thing that attracted me when I met Numpa Cha was the emphasis on this mantra puto, because uh, I'd practiced one year as a samanera in Nongkai on my own, just, just with uh, reading Nyanati Loka's book, uh, The Word of the Buddha, which is about the Four Noble Truths. And so then you get, I got to the point in the Samanera where I was really, you know, aware of impermanence and not self, but there was still this, this still I had not, it did not, had really sunk in about the knowing. You know, it was like the, this, uh, what is it that knows all this? And of course, when you're trying to figure that out with concepts, with words, uh, is, you know, you say, well, it can't uh, be Samanera Sumedho or anything like that. But then what else is it that, that it knows if it's not me uh, as this, this person, these identities of self as a Samanera, as a, a, a new name, Sumedho, and, and all the rest of the condition uh, condition in my mind that I would tend to, to, um, you know, it, that would influence my experience in the present. So then, these words like Buddha Dhamma Sangha, Puto Tamo Sangko, 
And over the years, these words have, uh, you know, they can be just kind of ceremonial poly chants and, and we can, uh, you know, chant them and, and, uh, you know, it's our tradition and see it in just this external form. Uh, and as a part of, you know, do we really need Buddha Dhamma Sangha or can we just be mindful without Buddhism at all? Can we, do we really need the Vinaya? Can't we just be mindful without all these restraining precepts and, and that, that's part of a tradition? Uh, many of us have asked ourselves, oh, is this really necessary? And then various teachers and methods of meditation do. Uh, you know, imply that you, know, you don't really need uh, any of these conventions because you're letting go of old condition phenomena, old conventions. And so what's the point of of becoming a bhikkhu, a monk? Because you're entering right into a very a powerful, uh, very uh, kind of strict and, and, uh, lim- and a convention that limits what we can actually do and say. So then, of course, the doubt, the thinking, do we really need uh, all this? Can't we just do it just through being mindful? And of course, when I asked Lung Pa Cha this years ago, he said, true but not right, right but not true. It's a kind of conundrum or koan, which is, uh, you know, because my uh, limited way of thinking was if it's true, it has to be right, and if it's right, it has to be true. That had you know, I didn't really differentiate between right and true. And Gautama said, "Too, they're my jing jing, they're my too." Interesting one, because I was expecting them to give me the party line. You have to have to, you know, you have to keep it like this. You have to do it this way, and and a kind of strong, uh, uh, you know, exposition and force on the things that you have to have in order to to really practice properly. I was expecting a sermon uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and expecting a kind of teaching about this is what you have to have and you can't do it any other way. But Nung Pan Cha wouldn't teach like that. He brought it into a reflective style. True but not right, right but not true. Well, that takes your thinking mind into a different place, isn't it? It's, it's uh, at least it did with me. I don't know about anyone else. And when somebody of the caliber of Lung Po Cha says, says such a thing, it's, you're not just going to dismiss it. I mean, you take it quite, you know, I, everything he said, I was taking quite seriously. Because I, 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 I kind of felt he would never say anything just flippant or, uh, you know, of, of no value that this was an important reflection he was giving me. And over the years of living this life, you know, the, the um, um, you know, like today, this Patimoka on, on this moon night, uh, the, the funeral, the cremation of Tanjotipanyo, and and the the power of this traditional form as it's kept in this way is something that uh, we learn how to use not to identify and cling to but to to reflect from so that the limitation that we experience through Vinaya is not some kind of uh, ascetic practice to to bind us to conditions and moral precepts uh, in order to to make us conform, it can be that we can use it in the in that way, or else we we ask ourselves how can we use this form for awareness? And this is, you know, this is how how to use the vinaya. Uh, as we've learned it through this Thai forest tradition, Lung Po Cha. Sometimes we get into incredible arguments and views about Vinaya and get very angry and upset when somebody disagrees. So that's 
and of course the Kosambi bhikkhus and the story in the scripture about uh, you know opinionated monks about rules and what's right and wrong but the important thing is to observe this to observe to be the aware that which is aware when you're holding a strong view uh, uh, and that you feel is right and you feel somebody else is wrong uh, one can one can observe that as a mental state I can anyway I've certainly had my uh, life full of strong views and opinions to observe them and so this this is like puto tamo sanko the, the awakened consciousness awareness of dhamma or the way it is or uh, another uh, translation I like and for dhamma is reality is awakening to reality to the real when you want to uh, not use the Pali words they, well, how would you describe uh, Buddhist teaching it's, it's an invitation to awake to reality and it's interesting having lived in in Europe for so many years people tend to think we don't live in the real world I, I don't know how many times people have said, that you in the monastery don't live in the real world and the real world is in London with a mortgage and a wife and two and a half children and a job you don't like and we're not facing the facts of life the real world is you know for some people is like that it's about oh, all the, the being caught in their own limitations without any way out, any way to look at them and view them, but just stuck into a particular conditioned world view that that they've aligned themselves with, and then, then the, uh, the, uh, the teaching of the Buddha is to awaken us to that. It's not to pass judgment on other people's lives or lay life or or modern society or tradition but to awaken us to this natural state it's a top what they call tamachad it isn't a created kind of highly uh, subtle and advanced state of consciousness it's suddenly letting go of thinking letting go of our views and opinions when we really develop this letting go of conditioned phenomena when, when we have moments where we let go, where there's nothing left, but there's still awareness. Consciousness still operates. And then there's discernment. There's a panya can inform us of noting non-attachment. Noting attachment is like this. Non-attachment is like this. It's not saying non-attachment is better than attachment, because <laughs> then you're back into the same delusion. But discerning self and non-self, when do you become a personality? Or do you assume you're the same person all the time, when you're asleep, when you're awake, when, you, when you're feeling well, healthy, vigorous, when you're feeling sick? nauseous when you're young or old, when life is going well, when life is falling apart. Uh, it, are you, is it the same person that, that you can observe or is, does it change according to conditions? And so investigating the atta duaton or the self-view or sakaya ditti, it's a, that which is aware remember this is awakening to the self so that you can observe it rather than operate from some idea about not having any self because even if you believe that there isn't any self it's still an attachment to a belief to a perception or how you interpret Buddhism so it's not about believing in no self but recognizing and this takes, of course, this sati sampachanya, a kind of apprehension uh, of, the, of this moment. 
for me when, when, for me to become a person I have to start thinking again I have to start thinking I'm Ajahn Sumedho and I'm an American and, and all like that then then if I have no no understanding of that is merely convention it's just a samut what they call samut tacha I tend to operate from the sense of a, of a self limited to my name my experience my memories my character tendencies my emotional habits can't help it if I buy into that perception without observing it then I create this world that is unique to me as a person is the Ajahn Sumedho type world that's going to be different from your world than the world that you create out of the self but that which is aware of self that is awareness or puto aware of Dhamma of the way things are Dhamma then is the reality or the way it is it's tamacha. It's the. It's nature. It's not. We don't create dhamma. We don't. And it's not something that that we have any say about. It's just learning to recognize dhamma the way it is at this moment. And so each one of us has to learn to trust ourselves more to observe, not to. And this observing is. And I reiterate, not a critical saying that. Anything you're feeling at this moment is good or bad, right or wrong, but it is the way it is. Now this, this kind of practice, the reflection, this is what I've loved about this life, is, is this, uh, this encouragement to do this, because there isn't much encouragement uh, in, as far as my experience in what they call quote, the real world, unquote, is. You know, my experience as a lay person was very much uh, about the ego of promoting myself and comparing myself with others and and uh, trying to get, prove myself, get somewhere, fears about, you know, you know, feeling not as good as somebody else or feeling jealous or competitive and obsessed with various views and ideas. That was the world that I created before I knew how to reflect on it. And it was, a, a, you know, a world that always led to some form of suffering, unhappiness, worry, anxiety, despair. As, a, as you know, with no understanding of how to, to get out of it, how to free oneself from this. It's so easy to blame circumstances. They, you know, we're looking for causes, external causes for one's misery. Or maybe we just blame ourselves. We're not good enough. We, we have it, you know, we're, we're born to suffer and, and, and where some people are born to be successful and happy or, and it wasn't that I wasn't successful, but even worldly success was some form of suffering because the ego was fed on being successful and when you weren't then you you felt really terrible when you failed at something or or somebody else was did it better than you did and and so there seemed to be no end to this form of this this illusion of a self one's whole world uh, generates from this delusion of a self and so then this uh, Puto, observe what is the self. What is Sakya Diti? It's the first fetter, isn't it? It's one, you know, the first one to deal with before we can get any perspective on Dhamma. If we interpret Dhamma always from the self, and that happens a lot, you know, we my view of the Dhamma, my view of the Vinaya, my view of the Buddhist teaching, and so forth can come from, uh, you know, generate from the self-view. When I read the Majima Nikaya, the lay person, you know, I interpreted it from a mind that was, uh, you know, brought up in a very Christian family, an American middle-class Christian conditioned view of life. 
influenced how I tended to read the Pali words or the translation of the Majjhima Nikaya because I hadn't really practiced yet to understand it. I, tried, I did my best to try to interpret it according to uh, my own way of, of seeing or try, uh, uh, the attempts to understand it through the self. Now in the monastic life the point is not to bind yourself to monastic form out of self-view. It's not, you know, I'm senior to you or I'm you know, I'm, I, I meditate longer than you do. The way we can, we can create a self out of monastic tradition is possible. So, important thing is not to, to create yourself into some kind of monk uh, or compare yourself with other monks, but to observe. That's what monasteries are really what their use is, they give us, they take us out of that that rat race of modern life, the real world, and give us an opportunity to observe and reflect. And not not to condemn the world or, or deny it uh, in any way, but to recognize. Lung Po Chao was always saying the end of the world, and he pointed to his heart and he says, here, the end of the world is here. <laughs> I remember in England that would really upset some people because the, 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 these perceptions of end of the world, the Armageddon, it's the, you know, everything's going to, you know, it's part of our cultural view to see the world as external, as the planet Earth, as, uh, as New York and London and Bangkok and so forth, the end of London and the Bangkok and so is this is this what he means or how do we translate world so that it has a practical value it's not just some absurdity or taken for granted that the real world is is what everybody thinks it is and so then we start observing the world I create the sense of myself my fear fears that arise and uh, anger, uh, sexual desire, confusion, worry, uh, restlessness, sleepiness, woolly, you know, the five fetters, the, the five uh, kilesas, and so forth that, that we have. These are convenient ways of collecting ourselves around what we're feeling to ob observe dosa, anger, aversion is like this uh, lust and greed is like this uh, moha and, uh, doubt and worry, anxiety, sleepiness, restlessness all these kind of irritating, frustrating problems that we experience when we're not either angry or aroused sexually then we tend to sink into worry anxiety, boredom, sleepiness, restlessness. So in meditation, then, uh, like vipassana is looking into the way things are. And the way things are then are clearly pointed out. We're not trying to, to evaluate their worth, but recognize the common characteristics of all phenomena as impermanence, uh, unsatisfactoriness and non-self. So, in my own ex experiments with these, with this, is that I became very much aware that for me to become a person, I have to really start thinking. I have to think I, just the pronoun English pronoun I. What does that do? When you you just think, think to yourself, I, uh, isolate I and just think I. And it has no, you haven't come to any conclusion yet, but it's a statement of presence, isn't it? It's a statement of being, which is fair enough. It's not personal yet. It's not like a personality comes from I. 
but then I, I, I add to it, I am Ajahn Sumedho. Then this I becomes a person. And then you get into the pronouns like me and mine. And these, these give this sense of, uh, of a strong personal attachment or possessiveness. My thoughts, my possessions, my view. These are mine. What I like, what I think, what I don't like, what I think is wrong, what I feel isn't right. These are all created with words, with thought. And so the thinking process, it, remember that you don't start thinking when you're born. A baby born to English-speaking parents doesn't come out and say, I am a little white baby born in a middle-class family in the United States. <laughs> I mean, it, that comes later, maybe. But then this, uh, this I, just contemplate uh, you know, in your own language, because some of you, you know, are, are conditioned with different with different language. But in terms of English, I, me, and mine. These are what we call, in gram grammatical terms, pronouns. So, just to point out that the the, the singular I. Uh, can be a fair enough statement of presence and it doesn't it isn't it isn't saying anything other than announcing one's presence and then am a verb follows in grammatic well this is how you learn languages through through that sequence of nouns pronouns verbs adjectives adverbs so language is a condition that we acquire after birth. Uh, when a baby is born, its natural form, its body is a natural form. It's not created through through uh, ignorance or self or you know, it's called it's a, just a form in nature like anything else, other forms that that arise in nature. The the body is this. The consciousness that the, the, the baby experiences is not uh, a, a Thai consciousness or a, a Western consciousness. It's not male or female. It's consciousness is natural. Nature, bintama cha. So, so recognize that, that the rupa and vinyana are natural conditions. Vedana, then also, we feel, you know, because it's a sensitive form born in the sense realm. Uh, it was born, and it's born with senses. It's a conscious form that uh, sees, hears, smells, tastes, touch, and then we learn to think in terms of using language and memory and learning, acquired knowledge, and views, cultural conditioning, social Assumptions, social attitudes uh, of of our particular family and society. But I'm pointing to what is natural first. But that isn't Thai, is not English, is not Western, not Eastern. Vedana then is, you know, the, the experience that we have to feel pleasure painful and neutral Vedana, just through the senses and uh, through consciousness, through the senses. And then we're conditioned through Sanya Sankara, culturally primed condition with language, with the prejudices, views, opinions, attitudes, assumptions of our mother, our father, our social background and so forth. So that's why when we when we're mindful, we're not we're not operating from the conditioned realm. We're not operating from uh, the conditioning we get through culture, through through social conditioning. We're not. It's not a Asian ability or 
or a European, it's, it's, it's a natural ability that the Buddha emphasized. And that the Buddha itself, the word Buddha means awakened consciousness in a human individual. Awakened to reality. And then what we awaken to is the changing conditions that we have to experience. The Sakyatiti, Sila Bhattabharamasa, Vichikicha, the first three fetters or Sangyojanas, Sangyotam, these are the, the conditioning we get after we're born, uh, after we already have a body and co- uh, consciousness and a body, then it's conditioned. <clears throat> It has its own karma, but then also it's influenced by the feelings, attitudes, biases, cultural attitudes, social assumptions and that of our parents and peers, family and tribe and social group and generation. By our gender, you know, what we identify with the gender of the body. So you notice the wars, the problems are all around attachment to these conditions, these identities, views and opinions, uh, prejudices and biases that we acquire. And, and so it's contemplated when we're aware. Mindfulness puts us back into that infantile state before we start thinking. <laughs> but a baby, you know, has its own wisdom to survive, you know, so it ha- operates from instinctual intelligence. Uh, it knows when it's hungry, when it's tired, and so forth. But now we're, we're adult men, and so we have a whole baggage, a whole pack on our back of conditioned attitudes and phenomena that influence how we see ourselves in the world around us. So in the monastic life such as we're living it here at Nanacha recognize it it's not uh, it's not for conditioning to just create a new identity uh, from the self position but it, it gives us a it's a vehicle for reflection for observing and witnessing knowing Dhamma when all condition the Dhamma of impermanence all conditions are impermanent. Anichang tukang anatta. And then that's a, a way of reflecting to break down the attachments, to begin to see through uh, the clinging, the obsessiveness, the compulsiveness that we might have in our relationship to the self and our views and opinions. And then we can begin to see the we come more and more reflect on when something's present in absence, when anger is present when it's not present, when lust is present when it's not present, when delusions of various sorts, worry is present when it's not present. We're observing the presence and absence of conditioned phenomena as in in our own mind in our jitta and that, so that's what puto or this intuitive ability that uh, as this species of creature on this planet humanity human beings we can actually use you know and this is what the, the this is the teaching of the Buddha as we've you know inherited it through a tradition if he hadn't established a tradition, it would have died out, forgotten long ago, 2,555 years ago. Nobody would remember the ascetic, the wise ascetic Gotama, who said he was the Buddha. It would have, probably there are many, many Bajeka Buddhas or enlightened individuals who have realized Dhamma, but have not established any any conventional form to carry it through in time, and so that's one reason why the Theravada school is so successful, 
as a tradition because it has been able to carry this teaching uh, of the Buddha and to keep within the, uh, the limitation structure of the Vinaya as a part of a tradition. And if we didn't have that, then it would have died out long ago. So that's the, the value of a tradition. That's why, uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure to change the tradition, modernize it, make it more with the times, more psychological, more, <laughs> more appealing to, to stressed out people in New York City and so forth, to, to make it, you know, so that it, it can be a kind of psychotherapeutic approach. But with, uh, I, with my, encounter with Lung Po Cha and, and training with him, it was through this kind of practice that I began to understand and, tra and, and appreciate this tradition as a tradition. Again, on Americans, we don't have very many traditions. Fourth of July, I think. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> Uh, American independence from the oppressive British. Uh, <laughs> but that's not very old. Uh, not even 300 years old. So uh, and, uh, this is 2,555 years it survived through how many civilizations, kingdoms, uh, successes and failures and changing conditions on a on an ongoing uh, upheaving level of, of different, you know, of the whole history of humanity from that time to the present. So this is, you know, to, to, you know, the, to try to, what I'm trying to do is, uh, you know, encourage you to, to use this form for this awakening, learn, recognize it's not about making yourself into anything or attaining. People talk about attaining stream entry and, and once return or non return or arahant. And, and, and I just don't like to speak like that because those, those, those are mere ways of, of suggestions to help us to observe. They're not for identity not for me as a personality to become a stream emperor or an arahant or not to become one or whatever. It's not about language, about identity, but about mindfulness and wisdom. And so these, these teachings of the Buddha then are, you know, here to, then if you just grasp them, the words themselves, the concepts that you interpret through your cultural condition approach to life and self-views, uh, it's better probably to attach to it out of ignorance than not than to attach to other things. I'm not denying that. But for, to get the full benefit and appreciation of this of these teachings, of the the very skillful teachings the Buddha left us and, and how to use the Vinaya, then this takes the actual practice, willing to, to relinquish, to live within the boundaries of, of this Vinaya, uh, and to, to observe one's own reaction, one's own emotional reaction to restraint, to living within community, with the core what? Uh, that, that Nung Po Cha emphasized so much. Learning to live within structures and letting, that we begin to see our own ego, our own views, our, uh, ways of seeing tradition or, or cultural conditioning. Uh, those of us who, who come from, uh, outside of Thailand, our, our own views about Thailand, about Thai Buddhism and, and unlike that, we, through this kind of reflection, we begin to see those as views, not as truths or assumptions that we operate from. Because we're moving toward, not toward identity 
in, in even a religion, but to free ourselves from identity. So it's a, like a total relinquishment of conditioned phenomena, which is not annihilation, but a relinquishment means letting, letting things be what they are. We have to live within the structures of our own human form till it dies and within the societies that we're part of. And we choose this particular limitation. We, we ask three times to take the precepts to become a, um, a samanera, a, a bhikkhu. And then why do we do it? Not for an identity, but for, it's a convention to encourage us to awaken to the reality of Dhamma. So I offer this as a reflection uh, for this evening. The, uh, just It's an encouragement, not to meant, meant to be a, even a teaching, but encouragement to, to learn how to trust yourself more, to open, to observe, rather than operate from all kinds of views and opinions and prejudices. So I offer this for reflection.